Go ahead. <laughs> Thank you, Sara. And um, as Sara said, we will talk about the judgment regarding income requirement for permanent residence permit that just came just recently, last week. And my name is Robert Andersson. I'm a head of negotiations team here at SULF, but I'm also working quite a lot with migration issues. So uh, what we will talk about today is what was this judgment really about and what did the court say and how will the decision change the situation compared to uh, before? and specifically how it will affect you as doctor candidates or researchers in practice and how you can handle the new situation. Uh, and we will also discuss that this is not the final solution to all the problems we have seen uh, for certain reasons that we'll come back to. Uh, and in the end, we will answer as many questions as possible. So, the judgment from the Court of Appeal or Migrationsöverdomstolen uh, is a large step forward uh, and it was um, um, long awaited uh, as it was about two years since the new requirement for permanent residence came into place, as you know. <clears throat> so, uh, just a short background, the Court of Appeal uh, or Migrationsöverdomstolen is the Supreme Court when it comes to migration issues. So it's not possible for Migrationsverket to appeal this decision any longer. Uh, the judgments from this court sets precedence and uh, a precedent should be followed by not only Migrationsverket, but, but also the migration courts. Uh, and we have four of them in Luleå, Stockholm. Gothenburg and Malmö. Uh, and uh, the judgment uh, is uh, uh, in the short term, it's MIG, uh, stands for this court. And the case number is 2023-18, uh, or the case number as such was 1449-23. Uh, and uh, as I said, this decision came uh, last week, December 13th. Uh, so, and what was it about? Uh, the question that the court answered was what is required to meet the income requirement for permanent residence permit? And this requirement was introduced into the legislation in July 2021. And the key term that um, they looked at here uh, was uh, for how long the um, income should last, and the term in Swedish here is vis varaktighet, you might say certain dura durability, and uh, the case uh, was about a doctor candidate at the Agricultural University, so it's uh, highly interesting to us, uh, and uh, the outcome was that the Migration Court gave the uh, uh, or the migration, first migration court in Luleå in this case, gave the applicant permanent residency. Uh, and that decision was not changed by the uh, <coughs> Court of Appeal. Uh, but the Migra Migrationsverket appealed the decision from the migration court in Luleå and claimed that the income must last for 18 months. And also that any statement about the possible extension from the university should not be considered. Uh, and that the only thing that should be considered is the contract you have at the time they take the decision. That has been their line uh, until, uh, all the way until from July 2021. So, uh, so what did the court say? <clears throat> the court concluded that the income requirement is met if the income lasts for one year or more. Uh, and this is basically the same as what they have said before in, in other situations when it comes to the income requirement for family reunification, when you want to bring family members to Sweden in some situations. So they say there is no reason to have any other requirement for permanent residence permit. And I, I should say that was the basically the best possible outcome we could get given the circumstances. Uh, 
they also said that it's not necessary that it's the specific employment you have at the time for the decision that must last for one year, uh, if it's likely that the income will last for longer time. And this means that the situation in each individual case must be considered. <clears throat> so the, the probability that you will have a new employment or a standard employment, basically. Uh, and they also said that in order to get permanent residency, you must have lived in Sweden for some time. And in this case, they concluded that the applicant had had an income during that those that time. And uh, as you know, that's also a requirement to get residence permit for uh, doctoral studies or research. Uh, and the point here, I think, is that uh, if you have had employment for some time, it's more likely that it will be it will continue. So, uh, how will the judgment change the situation? Uh, as I said, it sets a precedence for cases that are not yet concluded by Migrationsverket, uh, or if you have got a negative decision from them, or uh, you have appealed to the court, the court must also consider this new judgment. Uh, and uh, so from now on, an employment contract that lasts for one year at the time of the decision should be enough, as long as the income is high enough. And, and uh, the requirement this year is that the income should be 5,717 crowns per month plus your part of the housing cost. So if you are two adults that share housing, you only need to cover half of the housing cost, no matter who pays what there. This amount uh, will increase next year due to inflation, but uh, this is the requirement at present. Uh, if the contract is shorter than one year, uh, but it's considered likely, that the employment will be extended or you can show that you have, uh, you will get, or it's likely that you will get a new employment that can also be enough, which is something new. Uh, and what we are waiting for now is more information on how Migrationsverket will handle the new situation. Uh, we were supposed to have a meeting with them yesterday that was canceled for uh, some reasons, but one reason was that they have not yet uh, made a conclusion on that, and they have to update <clears throat> their guidelines to their case officers, but also their web page, I assume. Uh, and I checked just today, and they have not yet done any changes uh, at the web page. So if you read there, you will st still see that 18 months is, is required. Uh, but it's important to know that the judgment will not change any decision retroactively uh, and uh, so we'll come back to that what you can do in such a situation um, and how will it affect doctor candidates and researchers uh, well uh, you must still fulfill all the other requirements for permanent residency of course that you have four years uh, with se within seven years uh, with residence permit for doctoral studies research or work and you should basically have lived in Sweden uh, during that time as well. Uh, you should have shown good conduct. Uh, you should have an intention to stay in Sweden. And uh, later on, we will see new requirements in the legislation when it comes to language tests and also tests uh, about the knowledge about the Swedish society, but that's not yet implemented. So uh, how will the judgment change the situation for doctor candidates and researchers? Again, here, uh, as you uh, can only apply for permanent residency when a residence permit is about to run out, uh, or if the permit you have may be revoked uh, when you apply for a new one, uh, there might be some issues regarding timing, and this is nothing new to you, I guess. But as an example, if you have a residence permit for four years already from the start as a doctor candidate. Uh, uh, you, you can only apply for permanent residency when that's that permit is about to run out. And if you 
at that time uh, cannot show that you have uh, at least a year uh, employment, then that might, might be a problem if you have less than a year until graduation, for example. Um, in some cases, of course, you can get some kind of statement from the university about an extension for teaching parental leave or something. That can, of course, help. And also remember that you can ask the, employ the university to hire you for up to two years as doctoral candidate after the first year. Although we see that many university just, <clears throat> universities just employ for one year at a time. Um, also, uh, an advantage with this new judgment is that if you have a contract for two years, for example, as postdoc, it's now a lower risk that a long handling time will affect your decision. Um, as we know before, if you had two years and the application or the handling time was longer than six months, you might not have uh, 18 months left and, you were, and your application was rejected. Now, Basically, the, the handling time can be up to one year in that situation. So, uh, how to handle the new situation? If you have a pending application at Migrationsverket, uh, you can refer to this judgment uh, and uh, also add any information to your case about your contract and the likelihood that the contract will be extended or the likelihood that you will get another employment. And here you might need some kind of statement to support that, of course, from the university or any other employer. Uh, if you have not applied for permanent residency yet, uh, but for example, an extension, you may consider to contact Migrationsverket and uh, see if you can uh, also apply for permanent residency. Uh, if you have a pending case and have been waiting for more than six months, you should ask, uh, you can ask Migrationsverket to conclude the case uh, within four weeks and then refer to this judgment at the same time. Uh, if you have got a negative decision and there is st still time to appeal, that is within three weeks from the day you receive the decision, it might be a good idea to appeal and also refer to this case and hope that the court will handle the case rather quickly. Uh, and if you're not able to appeal uh, for some reason, then you can send a new application if possible. And if possible means that, again, if you have a residence permit that is valid for some time, it might not uh, be possible to apply again until that is about to run out. So, <clears throat> I also <clears throat> want to mention a few things that you should remember. And that is one thing is that you can also at any time, even when you have a residence permit, apply for status as long-term resident or in Swedish, varaktigt bosatt. The requirement here is a bit different. It's five years consecutive in Sweden with residence permit or legal stay. And here, uh, stays abroad are also accepted up to a certain limit. Uh, the income requirement is different here in a way that you can also count other incomes like unemployment benefits, stipends, or even incomes from a family member. Uh, and also here, the requirement has said to be that you should, uh, the income should last for one year at least. Uh, if you get this status, you can easier move to and work to in other uh, EU countries, or at least most of them. Uh, and the point here is that if you are granted long-term residency, you will automatically also get permanent residence permit without any further requirements. And if you uh, have permanent uh, residency, you can also apply for citizenship uh, when you have been here for five years. Uh, and one question that we have already got, if this new judgment about permanent residency will also affect applications for long-term residency. And uh, here the, the rules are a bit different, of course, but 
although they are similar as well. Uh, and the long-term residency is also based on the EU directive. So you have to consider some um, court uh, decisions from the EU court, but uh, it could be a one case that is already, uh, one issue that is already um, uh, in the court after an appeal is that how to uh, look, how to handle unemployment benefits that you might get in the future, uh, if that should be counted or not. And the says it will not be counted and we'll see what the court come up with. But of course, it might be that this judgment will also affect how to make the assessment about future income. At least it's not uh, uh, a disadvantage compared to before. So just in summary, what, what is new after this judgment? And uh, I, sh I should say it's two things. First, how long must an income last? Uh, and before, Amigasjonsverket has said that it's 18 months at the time for the decision. And from now, the court has said that one year uh, is enough. But it's still uh, the time for the decision, I would say, because that's something they have said. This court has said in, in another case that it was not about income requirements, but there they said that it's the situation at the time for the decision that matters. Uh, and how can this requirement be fulfilled? Uh, before Migrationsverket said it's only uh, through unemployment that lasts for 18 months and no prediction about the likelihood for an upcoming employment can be made. And the court said that individual assessment must be made about the likelihood for an extension or new employment. And this is, of course, a situation when your current employment does not last for a year or more. And I guess this is the critical point that we are waiting now to see how Migrationsverket will ma make these assessments in practice and what they will come up with in their new guidelines. So, <clears throat> and then um, another thing to remember is that uh, if you are not able to get permanent residency for some reason, of course, you can still apply for other types of residence permits and stay here. So, for example, if you have completed studies, which means uh, gra graduated or finished your research time, if you have had a residence permit for research, and you can apply for a residence permit for one year to look for a job. Uh, you must uh, be able to support yourself during that this time, but here uh, unemployment benefits, for example, will count. Uh, and also bank savings and other incomes. Uh, if you uh, get a job during the, the, that year, you are allowed to work uh, without a work permit, uh, as long as this permit is valid. The problem we have here still is that <clears throat> you, you cannot apply for a residence permit for research or studies when you have this one year permit. So you can only apply for residence permit for other types of jobs, which is kind of weird, but that's how it is. Uh, so uh, in order to get a residence permit for research or studies, you will have to leave Sweden and apply and come back again. <clears throat> so that's the disadvantage with this type of permit. But of course, you can also apply for extension of your residence permit for studies or research, or work permit, and perhaps uh, other types of permits as well. So uh, what remains to be done? Uh, so we will continue to work hard. As I mentioned, this is not uh, something that will solve all the problems that we have. Uh, so we need some changes in the legislation. Uh, uh, and uh, some of the, the problems that remains um, will not be affected by this decision. Uh, but if, of course, if you're able to get permanent residency uh, easier than before, uh, some of these problems will not appear. <clears throat> and that was basically the situation we had before 2021. It was not really a large problem <clears throat> uh, as many could get permanent residency. 
the government has said that an inquiry will be started about the situation for doctor candidates and researchers, but no such decision has been made yet. Uh, and we have uh, published 10 different problems that we want to see a solution to uh, at our webpage. And we have also handed that uh, those requests uh, over to the politicians. And if you want to read more about the rules and regulations, you will find a link here. Uh, we have not, I should say, we have not yet updated the information based on this new judgment because we are waiting also to see how Migrationsverket will uh, handle this in their new guidelines. Uh, so, but there are much more information there about other types of permits and also long-term residency. <clears throat> So, uh, and uh, I uh, finally, I would like to mention that you are most welcome to join SULF and become a member. And as a member, you can get advice and support on issues related to your employment or doctoral studies or situation at the university in general. And the membership also comes with different benefits uh, like the income insurance that will um, adding uh, add money to your unemployment com uh, compensation if you earn more than the ceiling there. Uh, but we also offer discounts for other insurances and much more. And you can read more at, at our webpage and also, of course, apply for membership. And the membership fee uh, is uh, somewhere between 125 and 270. Uh, so 125 is for doctor candidates with employment and for others, researchers and teachers and postdocs uh, with, with their employment, it's 270. And that includes the income insurance. But remember that you must also be a member in Akademikernas A-Kassa for a year in order to use the income insurance. And if you have a stipend, the fee is even lower than this. And I want to mention that uh, uh, if you joined, uh, if you sign an application now, you can uh, choose 1st of January as the starting date for the membership. Uh, if you are a doctor candidate, because then you will be able to have a free membership for three months from January. Uh, however, if uh, you would need also December to qualify for the income insurance because you must be a member in SURF for a year to qualify. <clears throat> you can choose 1st of December as the starting date, uh, but then you will not be able to use uh, the free membership for three months. So you have a choice there when you fill in the application form today. So, uh, that's that. And uh, also I want to mention that in 15th of January, we have a new webinar uh, about uh, a situation for you as new in Sweden or rather new. Uh, and anyway, if you want to learn something about how things work in Sweden, this is the webinar for you. And there we will talk about more than migration issues. We will talk about unemployment insurance and many other things. And we also have upcoming activities for next year, and you can find them in our calendar. And that's about postdoc, pensions, and many other things. And some of those uh, webinars are in English. Uh, but the next one, the first one for next year is January 15th at 12 o'clock. And that's uh, for those of you who want to learn more about <laughs> the Swedish way to handle things. So uh, that's that. So that was everything. And uh, now it's time for questions. And we do have a lot of questions. We have about 40 questions. So <laughs> I'm not sure that we will be able to answer all of them. Maybe you can just uh, stop sharing the screen. Yeah. We will see your <laughs> the whole picture of you. Okay, let's start from the top. 
How yeah. can individuals who had a contract exceeding 12 months in 2021, but not 18 months, and therefore applied for an extension of permanent residency, file a complaint about this situation with Migrationsverket? Uh, I don't think it's possible to to change much in this situation because this judgment affects the future and not the past. So it's only open quest open cases that can be affected. So then, of course, it's um, kind of irritating that it has been as as it has. But um, if you have got an extension and uh, you have, of course, the chance to apply again when uh, the extension is about to run out. And then I, of course, understand that the situation can be different now, and you might not fulfill the requirement now, but you did before. So so it's uh, it's a pity that this judgment did not come earlier. Uh, it's now two and a half years, uh, about two and a half years after this new legislation came into force. Okay, so if it takes six months for Migrationsverket to look at applications, and 18 months was calculated from the time they look at the application, not when we submit the application. Is this still the case? Do we need one year plus six month contract? Uh, yeah, basically you need one year plus whatever handling time there is between the application and decision. Or if you can show that if it's less than 12 months, if you can um, if it's likely that you will get a new employment, uh, that could also be considered. But as I said, this is the critical point. How will Migrationsverket make this assessment and what kind of statements do they need? Uh, I, I think they would need something that support that. But as I also said, the, courts, the court mentions that if you have, and that's not nothing new, that's also in the previous decision they took already in 2019 about the income requirement for family reunification. They talked about that if a person has shown that they are, they will get the get a new contract all the time, then it's likely that it will happen also in the future. So, um, but uh, that that is again that's that's the hard hard point here and. Uh, we don't know exactly how they will do it and how it will end up in each individual case. Uh, and what are the measures one can take to show that they will get a new employment? Yeah, I think, as I said before, now uh, any type of statement, and if you're a doctor candidate, for example, or also postdoc, and it's possible to get an extension and you can show some kind of statement from the university that um the studies for example are proceeding as planned and the <laughs> employment will be extended that's basically what was in um, found in this case that we they had so that that should be enough i hope uh if that's not possible you have to mention anything else for example um, if you have been at least offered or uh, something an employment somewhere but but this is uh, this is still an open question, and it will be based on each individual situation. Uh, regarding the waiting time for permanent residence permit via doctoral studies, is there a way to expedite the process? Given you have a case officer already. Uh, yeah, well, the general rule is that if you have been waiting for six months, you can ask Migrationsverket to conclude your case within four weeks. And if they do not uh, what you say, accept to do that, they can say that, for that, for, that it's not possible to do it in, within four weeks for some reason. Then you can appeal that decision to the court. And usually they will approve that appeal and ask Migrationsverket to take a decision as soon as possible. Uh, but it might still take some time. One thing you should remember is that the waiting time for an extension or any type of permit, I should say, for studies should not take more than 90 days. And uh, an application for permit for research should not take more than 60 days to handle. And if it takes longer, they should inform you about that. Uh, and uh, an application for 
Long-term residency should be handled within six months, but there is no fixed limit for permanent residence permit. So there you have to ask for, uh, for a conclusion <laughs> after six months. Uh, this is not really a general question, but I will try to make it. Uh, if your current permit expires this December and you have finished your PhD, you have no employment, but you will receive a CASA and your spouse is non-EU, will apply with me, has a permanent job. Is it a good idea to apply for permanent resi residency or to proceed with the permanent permit for looking for employment after studies? Well, it's hard to say. You can also apply as a family member, uh, as a uh, co-applicant there. So there are different options. But uh, as I mentioned, there are some negative aspects about when it comes to this permit for looking for a job if you want to go back to research. Um, but the point is that to get permanent residency, you must fulfill the income requirement yourself. You cannot rely on any family member. If you instead apply for long-term residency, but that requires then five years consecutive permit in Sweden, um, then uh, you can also uh, count incomes from relatives. So, so you have these different options and it's quite possible to have one application for long-term residency running at the same time as uh, an application for residence permit. Uh, and it's even recommended that you apply for uh, some kind of residence permit, even if you apply for long-term residency, as it's not clear if you are allowed to work in Sweden if you are not applying for a residence permit as well. So um, um, that's an um, advice. But uh, I think you should discuss also with Migrationsverket what is the best option here. And... Uh... Here's a question. If I'm not mistaken, we may apply for permanent residence after four years on a study permit, therefore leaving one year for standard PhD contract without any big extensions like maternity or paternity leave. And due to delays at Migrationsverket, when they will look at the case, it will be less than a year. Therefore, it will probably work only when you get your contract after PhD and for at least two years to accommodate for delay at Migrationsverket. Uh, yes, that's uh, that's what we mentioned, that uh, uh, if you do not have one year left uh, when you uh, when the application is uh, con uh, or the decision is made, that's a problem. And of course, if you are a doctor candidate and your graduation is expected to happen within a year or so, you're, you might not be able to show that you will get an extension after that. Uh, and then you would have to rely on the chance to get other types of jobs but it might of course happen that you have been teaching or or in on parental leave or sickness or a combination of those and that you are able to get a longer contract than one year uh, even after the first four years and then this new judgment may help but but that's the problem we still have and one solution we would like to see is that you should also be able to uh, get the permanent residency even if you have a temporary residence permit at the time so you can replace a temporary permit with the permanent because then you could file an application at at any time and you don't have to wait until it's about to run out. Just to clarify, does the income requirement of 12 months also apply for the permanent residence status? Sorry, can you repeat? I'm not really sure, but does the income requirement of 12 months also apply for the permanent resident status? Yeah, that's that's what it's about. I mean, if it's uh, for permanent residency, you need uh, to show that it's likely that you have an income for one year. And uh, here's a question about the residence for Ukraine citizens that study work here, but applied for asylum. Yeah. Uh, since Migrationsverket issued a law to pause the processing of all cases for asylum seekers from for Ukrainians that are not allowed to have temporary protection directive, will that time spent being asylum seekers be counted towards receiving permanent residence permit? 
uh, it will not uh, count for the specific rules for doctor candidates, researchers, or or workers that come to Sweden, because then you need those specific residence permits. And then there are, of course, possibilities also for asylum seekers to look for permanent residency. But that's um, that's other types of rules. But I know that uh, this uh, my, um, this directive uh, that came into force when the war started uh, in in uh, Ukraine uh, that was uh, the directive from European Union uh, that sort of. Uh, makes it impossible to apply for other types of residence permit, at least not from Sweden. But uh, so that's, uh, uh, of course, it's it's a good thing that that was open, but it also has a drawback for some people at universities, for example. Uh, do doctoral students have to apply for work permit, a long residence permit, after the doctoral employment ends? Uh, well, if if you get a new job, you must apply for some kind of permit uh, to take that job unless you apply for and get permanent residency, uh, because then you are free to work. What you can remember is that if you have had residence permit for, for studies or research and you have applied for a new residence permit before that runs out, you will keep the right to work uh, in Sweden, uh, and you can take any type of job, so you have no no restrictions there, which is good because that that is also the reason why you can get unemployment benefits. So, uh, but of course, you have to legalize your stay uh, and apply for some kind of permit uh, that you are able to get. Uh, if you get the permanent, sorry, I just scrolled to the end. If you get a permanent residence permit and you get a card and it says an expired date, what does that mean? What happens after that? Um, as I understand, uh, the cards as such will expire, but not the permit. So uh, it, it will be renewed without any issues. Uh, it, it's only if you, for example, commit crimes or things like that or leave Sweden for too long time that it will be revoked. So it's just a matter of like, exactly as your passport or your driving license lasts for some time and then you have to renew it. So it's, it's basically the same. Okay, good to know. Uh, if a doctoral student receives tax exempt scholarship, is that considered to be income? And uh, not when it comes to permanent residency, but if you apply for long-term residency, it can be also used as an income. So there, there is the difference. When it comes to permanent residency, it's said that it's only incomes from an employment, from your own company, or from some kind of social benefit, like parental leave sickness that you have at the same time as you have an employment. That, that's the only type of income that will count. So... Um, so unemployment benefits, stipends will not count for permanent residency, but they will count for long-term residency. Can we use, can you use time on master level, master level residence permit for long-term residency request? Uh, not yet in, in Sweden because um, uh, studies are uh, exempted from that, except if it's doctoral studies. Uh, then uh, in within EU, it's now uh, proposed that the, the directive for long-term residency should be updated. And there, there was one one part of that was to make it possible to count studies as well, uh, at least in the situation when you, after the studies, uh, will get a job uh, in that in that country. And in that directive, they also. One part also concerns the possibility to add times in different EU countries uh, to, to qualify. As it is today, you need five years in one country to get this status. Is there a disadvantage or advantage to have a permanent residency over long-term residency? Uh, well, the difference is that uh, 
once you have got it, the difference is that if you have long-term residency, you also have uh, larger uh, chances to easily move to other most other EU countries and live there and work there. Uh, but apart from that, uh, there is perhaps no no difference. And the only thing, perhaps, I mean, is that um, since long-term residency is based on the EU directive, it's harder for politicians in Sweden to mess around with the rules there uh, than compared to permanent residency, which are national uh, legislation. Uh, but if, as I said, you can have both applications running at the same time. And if long-term residency is approved first, you will get permanent residency automatically. So I would say that if you can apply for long-term residency, uh, that's uh, it's not a it's, there's no disadvantage to uh, apply for that. But remember to also apply for other type of residence permit to to make sure that you can work here uh, while you're waiting for a decision, and also that you can still receive certain social benefits from the Shekins Kassen. So that's a kind of a mismatching the regulation and, and we hope that can be solved as well but um, yeah uh, I know you spoke about this earlier but just to clarify can a person receive long-term residency with only one source of income as a family member income the person uh, itself doesn't have a job <clears throat> yes it's possible it was um a judgment in the EU court a number of years ago, which clarified that uh, you, you have to also consider incomes from uh, family members or not family members in general, but your closest family members, your partner, uh, basically. And um, if you live together and uh, in, in Sweden, it was interpreted that if you are, for example, married uh, or even if you're a sambus, uh, you are supposed to help each other with uh, to support your living costs, and that's why you can count that as well. So if it's high enough to cover for both of you, then then that's uh, that's perfectly enough. Uh, does the time spent doing a master in Sweden count for long-term residence? Uh, no, no. As I said, the studies, except doctoral studies, will not count to qualify for long-term residency and also not for permanent residency. I might I might ask questions that you already answered, but just let me know in that case. Does the period with the job search permit after doctoral studies count towards long-term residency or is it considered as interrupted residence as a new permit issued after it will start from date of decision resulting in a gap of residency? Yeah, um, that's a good question because uh, uh, when it comes to long-term residency, you should either have a residence permit, which is not for studies or some other situations that is perhaps not relevant here, uh, or as it said, a legal stay. And that term you can also find in the EU directive. And... Um, Legal stay was said to be, it was introduced um, when Brexit came because, to show that uh, British citizens that lived here before, uh, when, when they were still in EU, and, and that at that time had something called right of residence, that time should be counted as well. Uh, but uh, legal stay can, of course, be broader. And there is, for example, one court case where it has been said that waiting time uh, between two permits should be counted as a legal stay. And of course, this permit to look for a job is also a legal stay, or at least it's not illegal, but if it's legal in this regard, that's uh, an open question still. Uh, but uh, I would uh, I would suggest that you claim that if if, if you if, if, if required. Uh, and yes, one. So uh, a doctoral student with five years of employment, uh, for example, four-year contract and a full year of prolongation, could not uh, apply for permanent residency since the 12-month employment time from is from the date Migrationsverket looks at the application 
and not the date of submission, which can be six months afterwards. Yeah. Yes, that's that's true. It's it must be twelve months at the time for the decision, or at least uh, it should be likely that you will get a new job or an extension also after that. So that's the the key point here, and uh, what will be, of course, uh, based on situation from from case to case. But here we need to wait for Migrationsverket to see how they will interpret this new judgment. Uh, uh, do you expect any improvement in handling times in the near future? Um, Hard to say, but Migrationsverket uh, has said that they are working on this and they want to to reduce handling times and uh, specifically that it's important to follow the hand the limits for the uh, type of cases where there is a specific limit, like studies, research, or long term residency or work permit as well. So hopefully, yes, and. Um, one would hope also that Migrationsverket would get more resources to handle this, but uh, that remains to be seen. Uh, and here's a question regarding the new legislation on permanent residence for PhD students who commence their programs between 2018 and 2019. Uh, some of them are nearing the completion of their PhDs and may face the challenges of obtaining permanent residence under the existing legislation. Um, and what about the implication of this new legislation, given many of them won't be receiving the new contracts for remaining duration of their PhDs? Uh, could you shed some light on how the transition to the new legislation might impact their eligibility for permanent residency? Well, it's hard to say. Uh, but first, there, there is no new legislation. This is... Um kind of interpretation of the legislation so the legislation is the same but there are new new guidelines if you like um, and uh, again it's you you must somehow be able to make it likely that you will have an income from an employment or you know, your own company for uh, at least a year so um, and that that the new rules that came in 2021 affected everyone that did not have a decision before that date. So, so um, yeah. But of course, the, the closer you get to graduation, the less likely it is that you can get an extension that lasts long enough. Um, can case be appealed if the case is not concluded and request for is rejected? Uh, it depends what you... Um, if you have not, if the case is not concluded, you can not appeal. You can only appeal the decision once it comes. Uh, so you, the only thing you can do is to ask them to conclude the case if you have been waiting for six months, and then, and then appeal if it's negative. And uh, now we have to hope that Migrationsverket will not continue to take decisions based on the previous, their previous uh, interpretation. Uh, so that's one thing. And they had said that there is, they have not in general freezed all these cases. So there might still come uh, decisions. And if they are based on uh, the requirement of 18 months, then I would recommend that you appeal that decision to the court and refer to this new judgment that also the migration court will have to follow. Uh, I know you have uh, spoken about this, but is the new one-year income requirement for permanent residency from the date of application or from the day the decision on the application will be made? I would say it's the day for the decision because uh, in another case uh, that basically concerned how one should look at criminality, they said that it's the situation at the time for the decision that matters. So uh, I would say this that part is still the same as before. And this new interpretation uh, means that change that the change would apply to all permanent residence applicants, not only the PhD and researchers. Yes, it's it's uh, it's guide it's a guideline for all types of um, applications for permanent residency. But then, of course, 
some groups uh, might have larger chances to show that it's likely that you will get a new employment than other groups. But, but apart from that, uh, the rules are the same for every application for permanent residence. Uh, and if you're thinking about if you have a if your spouse is from Sweden is Swedish uh, and you will move with this person to another EU country for a couple of months, uh, not five months, but less, uh, does that create a break in the four years period for permanent residency or? Uh, it might be that um, the uh, it uh, that time will not be counted to qualify for permanent residency because uh, in general, you should live in Sweden when you have, uh, the, uh, at the same time as you have the residence permit here. But then there could be exceptions, for example, if you are sent out to work abroad for, for an employer in Sweden, but if you follow a family member to another country, that time might not count. But for permanent residence, it's enough to have four years within seven years. So gaps are not uh, critical as long as you fulfill that. But uh, if you apply for long-term residency, you should not stay abroad for more than six months at a time and not more than 10 months in total. Because then the, the qualification time will be broken and you will have to start all over again. And uh, is it a, is it worth to apply for long term residence if so, if you have a permanent residence permit? Um, yeah, it's uh, basically only if you plan to work in other EU countries or most of them that are included in this system, uh, or if you believe that it's safer to have that as well if something happens with the national legislation uh, regarding permanent residency. If you apply for a seek job residence permit after the PhD graduation and then you find a job, can you apply for a permanent residency at that time? Uh, yes, you can. Yeah. But what you have to do, and this is a very complicated uh, regulation, you have to look at in what situation you can apply for certain types of residence permit. Uh, um, and especially if you can apply uh, from Sweden and you don't have to leave. And Migrationsverket has a service. It's perhaps not very easy to find at their web, but where you can um, choose in a list what type of permit you have today and what you want to apply for. And then you will get an answer if it's possible to apply from Sweden or not. But uh, if you have this job seeker permit, you are allowed to apply for uh, all types of residence permit, basically, except for research or studies, which is stupid again. Uh, and we hope that will be changed. But um, any other type of job, permanent residency or uh, such things can be applied for. Uh, the five-year rule to get a long-term residence permit refers to, does it refer to uh, stay and research in Sweden only during the whole period, or can it be combined with resident permits from two EU countries? Uh, not yet, but as I said, there is a pro proposal that you should be able to count uh, time in different countries and add them together. Uh, and we will see if that comes through and, and <laughs> when it happens and, and when it's implemented in that case. So. But I, I guess even if it happens, it's a few years uh, from now that, because it has to be first decided by EU, the directive, and then there is the member, the member states will have some, get some time to implement it as well. Can unemployment insurance be considered for permanent residency according to the new procedure? Uh, no, there is that, it's still only incomes from employment or compa your own company that counts for a permanent residency, but again, for long-term residency, uh, unemployment benefit will be counted. Uh, if you could clarify a little bit more about being granted a long-term residency equal to grant, granted a permanent residency, the the differences and, and what you- Yeah, we have touched that. So, so uh, I think, uh, 
in most cases, people apply for long-term residency as a way to get permanent residency. That's the what you really want, and uh, that it could be easier as the income requirement is a bit easier to fulfill. Uh, so it's only uh, if you plan to move to other EU countries that long-term residency will make difference. Um, but uh, if you if you are able to get both, it's of course in a way better to have long-term residency because then you have all uh, possibilities open. The, the, the current, uh, I mean, the interpretation, does it change the effect the family members' permanent residency? The, the income requirement aspect. Yes. Um, well, in that way that this new requirement uh, or the new interpretation affects all applicants, uh, no matter uh, what you have been before. So the, in this case, the family member must have their own income still, but uh, it's enough with one year and not one and a half year as before. Um, and here's a question about part-time. I'm wondering if working part-time during the PhD to have some other part-time job and the PhD continues for seven years instead, would it be enough for permanent residency? Well, basically uh, what you need is a residence permit for studies or research or, or work or a combination of those for four years. But then you must also fulfill the requirements when they look retroactively. So if you, uh, and as you as a student are supposed, as a main rule, supposed to have full-time studies, there might be an issue if you are not on full-time studies that you have not fulfilled the requirement really. So I would recommend that you, if you want to have part-time studies and have for another job or something, and it's not related to parental leave or sickness or so, then you should contact Migrationsverket and ask if this work will work out or not. And to clarify how the four years are counted, do they deduct if you travel for work uh, more than six weeks a year in different countries? Or does this affect the time to wait for the decision based on the new possible 12-month update? Uh, well, uh, when, if you spend time abroad, uh, it's the, the, it's usually said that not more than six months per year is accepted. But also we have seen examples that if you, for example, work for the university, but you work abroad for some time, you have some research collaboration, for example, and you spend half a year or a year abroad, that time might also count as qualification time especially if you are hired by a state university. Uh, but it's still a bit unclear there, but uh, uh, it's possible. So I would recommend you to talk to Migrationsverket uh, in this case as well. And if you have money in your bank account for a long-term residency, is that accepted as a financial, financial support if it's enough for one year, for example? According to Migrationsverket, the savings as such will not count, only incomes from the savings, so interest rent, uh, and so on. But uh, uh, so that's that's a problem. Um, but uh, we don't know for sure. That's also perhaps an issue for the court to solve one day. But um, uh, for permanent residence, it, it will for sure not count. Uh, but uh, it will count for a temporary residence permit for as a job seeker, for example. Thank you so much for all your questions. We have we still have a lot of questions unanswered, but we will read them all and uh, see if we can clarify something on our website. Uh, it will probably not be able to do it before the, the holiday. Uh, just a last question. When do you think Migrationsverket will publish these new guidelines? Is it like? Uh, I'm not sure, but um, as I said, I was supposed to have a meeting with them uh, yesterday and that was cancelled. And we have a new meeting in the middle of January and hopefully around there some, somewhere <laughs> they will be, be able to handle this. And they should handle it because basically they have to follow this from already from December 13th. But uh, of course, it takes time to 
evaluate things as well. But but if they now take decisions based on the old interpretation, they basically uh, um, will not follow the new uh, judgments. Thank you so much, Robert, for, for the, this webinar. And thank you all participants. And I hope you all have a good day and a nice weekend and a <laughs> Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so Bye. much. Bye. Bye.